Hello, my name is Zaina Floyd and I'm the founder and creator of Caribbean Archive. So Caribbean Archive functions as an educational tool that is a digital database of Afro-Caribbean women and femmes who are dancers, artists, anthropologists, educators, poets, world and world makers all of whom um, that function within a post-colonial um, framework. Um, all these individuals who are featured on Caribbean Archive have created a scholarship of work that is representative of themes of agency and resistance. I'm also the co-founder of Zaza Uptown, which was founded last year by my friend Angelica and I. We are dedicated to the progress of practicing Afro-Caribbean women, femmes, and gender non-conforming practicing artists, specifically in the Uptown area of New York City um, and Mount Vernon, New York. Much of my independent research centers Black Caribbean woman narratives and themes of resistance while utilizing creativity. I am approaching this work as a student, first and foremost, and then later as an educator. I am also a practicing visual artist. Film is my medium as I am interested in themes of Black feminism and post-colonialism. Archival footage, text, letters, and archival images are one of my main devices for interrogating and engaging the past as references for imagining a different kind of world, one that we find ourselves functioning in and surviving in. I want to thank Jamie for creating this necessary and important platform and providing a space for various proxies of Black feminism. I want to also thank you for allowing me to speak about Caribbean Archive and the work that we do. The title of my teach-in is Afro-Caribbean Women of Postcolonialism Through the Practice of Art. I'll be focusing on fashion, dance, music, religion, and of course, head wraps. <laughs> the purpose for this discussion is to further highlight historical narratives of reference and to provide a visual language for the lack of representation of Black women in the Caribbean who have contributed profoundly towards defining a visual and bodily response of what resistance can look like. Here are some guiding questions. How have Afro-Caribbean women challenged decolonization through the practice of art? How has art served as a platform for liberation? How is art and dance an expression of resistance and world making? After leaving this discussion, I want for you all to reimagine themes of resistance and to think of the Caribbean as a radical landmass that has contributed profoundly to recentering and redefining resistance as a map for one to navigate. Most importantly, I want to give praise to Afro-Caribbean women and femmes who are nameless in the face of history. I hope to further highlight their names of historical and auditory methods of activism and ways of living beyond the white gaze. The readings I have I will discuss have led me to further examine and investigate Black Caribbean women navigating through a post-colonialist society while activating while actively practicing resistance through the uses of art. Women Warriors of the Afro-Latina Diaspora is a collection of personal narratives written by Yvette Modestine and Marta Morena Vega. 
It is a collection of narratives of Black women within North America, the Caribbean, and Latin America. The Women and Femmes and Women Warriors of the Afro-Latina Diaspora grapple with identity, but critically think about colonialism and how it has taken so much from individuals who occupy the islands and outside of it. They all live beyond the white gaze and beyond the, they find ways to live beyond all of these things that weigh black women and femmes down. Um, in, in Women Warriors of the Afro-Latina Diaspora, um, all of the individuals come from various um, backgrounds and areas of studies in which they are violently confronted with their Blackness in a radical method while utilizing voodoo, art, music, and the academic world. This reading sets the foundation for what I will be discussing. As we begin this journey, I think it's important for me to do, to define some terms. Post-colonialism, it is the study of the consequences of colonialism, such as the exploitation of land and people and the lasting effects of slavery, i.e. human trafficking. Specifically, I'm interested in claiming this term referring to after colonialism. Urzuli is a family of spirits in Haitian voodoo. The Urzulis are associated with femininity, water, and fluidity. I will be speaking about Haiti, Puerto Rico, Curacao, and Martinique. Art, dance, Music and films are a reflection of historical references and of the times. Through these mediums, individuals can resist the constraints of oppression, racism, and how the world constantly erodes, destroys, abuses, controls, and owns Black autonomy, especially Black women and femmes. Frequently, the topic of racism, colonialism, and enslavement are left out of the conversation within the art historical world. Particularly materials such as sugarcane, gold, cotton, silk, diamonds, paint, and variants of raw materials were exploited during the enslavement of African people. So this brings us to Haiti. Haiti is one of the most radical nations in providing a visual language for resistance through religion and dance. In this discussion, I want to further investigate pioneers who have directly used Haitian folkloric dance, which can be folkloric voodoo ceremonial and initiation dance as an archive and source for oral and historical narratives. Catherine Dunham in Island Possessed examines voodoo dances and culture while analyzing themes of race, class, and gender and the lasting effects of colonialism. Through Island Possessed, I discovered footage of Ruth Beckford choreographing a dance class at Medgar Evers. The class was performing, they were doing um, dance routines in the likeness of um, Catherine Dunham's, um, of the, it's called the, the Dunham Technique. Um, I think it's important to note that Haitian voodoo dance originated in Benin um, this dance was performed as a ritual prayer that calls onto the Luas. Yan Vulu is performed for Dambala, among other spirits in the Raja Rites. Dambala is one of the oldest Luas and offers guidance through dance and through dance, song, and music. He creates connections through multiple lived realities. He is known to play tricks with time. In Yanvalu, 
Jan Velu's elliptic displacement staging spirit time in the United States. Celia Weiss Bambara explores the, dis the dance Jan Velu as a spiritually engaged performance that are formulations of community that occur through the human body. She states, Haitian dance, Haitian movements, and choreographies beg analysis in relation to notions of liberation and unification. The Yan Velu dance cultivates the contact of the practitioners and the ancestors. It is a playful and joyous dance that allows the practitioner to travel beyond worlds and to travel beyond times and in different countries. Um, Haitian scholar Flogan states, it is through singing, playing, and dancing of the Yan Velu that Voodoonists established contact with the ancestors in Guinea. Seen in figure one, the dancers are near to the ground as they move their back up and down like the ripples of waves. This movement is best described like the fluid movement of a snake. I will play a five minute video showcasing Jan Velu. <laughs>
um, the dance is always performed in a group because it is a representation of community. Historically, this dance has been performed in Haiti on the plantations. It continues to retain its African um, foundation. Catherine Dunham has utilized dance as a rite of passage into gauging the bridge between one's um, cultural identity that is rooted in spirituality. Specifically, the traditional voodoo clothing is a portrayal of resistance from oppression, enslavement, and acceptance of one's African identity. Most importantly, colors are a welcoming and an invitation to the spirit. Dunham reframes the understanding of dance as a historical, academic, and an, a performative tool. Seen in figure two, she is wearing a head wrap and a colorful ensemble. The representation of articles of dress are crucial to the identification and recognition of one's semblance within a community that continues to retain its African um, cultural roots. Particularly, voodoo is a practice that predates colonialism. Voodoo is a fascinating religion that allows agency, representation, fluid, fluidity, and resistance while activating laws who are in the likeness of Black women. Before the conception of Catherine Dunham and her rich studies that have been informed by Haiti, Haiti has a lasting history of a bodily resistance that has been informed by African-based religions such as voodoo. Haitian woman resistance fighters such as Cecile Fatima was a Haitian mambo. She was a revolutionary fighter and actively played an important role in the slave rebellion and decolonizing Haiti. At the Bois Cayman ceremony, it was a strategic meeting of enslaved Africans who articulated and sought out a revolt. Voodoo aided towards the success of the Haitian Revolution. In Serving Loa, written by Nathaniel Morel, he explores voodoo as an African concept that exists in a hierarchy of spiritual beings. He states, the female spirits that belong to the Urzuli family are many in number. Urzuli Danter, Loa of womanhood and eroticism, she has many personalities said to embody the collective historical memory of women in the Haitian past. Cecile Fatima called onto the Urzuli Loa, utilizing their strength and traits in order to accomplish a successful rebellion. Urzuli Danter is seen and is always seen wearing blue, green, and red. An encyclopedia of African religion, blood from the wild pig, is a sacrifice. It is believed that Cecil Fatima sacrificed a pig, which is one of the sacrifices of Urzuli Danter. As we continue this conversation, I want to dive into the importance of articles of clothing. During Haitian ceremonies, colors are centered uh, as an importance in representing the loa that is being called upon and initiated. In Urzuli, the divine paradox as Rose in Chouvette's Color and as Naomi in Oliver's Mère Solitude, Boisvert surveys historical and religious prototypes of the voodoo feminine principles that are reflected in Haitian fiction. Bavar states, I contend that the voodoo loi is deeply embedded in Haitian fiction and culture, and as that her different manifestations as the young woman, the mother figure, and the red-eyed crone often appear in characterizations of women in the country's literature. I will play a five-minute video of Urzuli 
Donter. Um, this video took place in Haiti. Um, yeah, enjoy. <laughs>
In figure three, all of the practitioners that are representative of Azuri Danter has a head covering in red, blue, or green. They are shimmying the shoulders as their hands are folded on their backs, resting on their lower hips. It appears as... <clears throat> Candles are burnt to further prepare Loa, the Loa, um, to enter the space. All of these efforts are elaborate, remarkable, and breathtaking. During this specific ceremony, Loa's visit them. This is considered celebratory. The Representation of articles of dress are crucial to the identification and recognition of one's lua and also their semblance within a community that continues to retain its cultural roots. The importance of art, literature, and dance is essentially the foundation for decolonizing oppressive systems. This moves us into speaking about music. So music is a vital part of African-based religions, and it is also most definitely the pulp of the Caribbean. In staging the nation through art, music, and the Haitian diaspora, Diana Golden examines Haitian diasporic music as a device for nation building that reflects a collective history through the works of the musical composers Carmen Brouard and Julio Racine. She states, the call for a national musical voice, the exploration of African and folkloric elements of Haitian music, and in turn, the rejection of American and European stylistic elements grew from the social political context in Haiti at the time. The pool toward a politically and socially engaged music making contributed to the production of music history as a form of resistance. Haiti's ability to develop a unique and individual sound laid the foundation for nation building. Diana Golden states, art, music was used for further nation building, creating a cultural image across the diaspora. It is important that each Caribbean nation has a very individual sound um, this is a representation of a nation fashioning themselves to the world, defining their, their language, their music, and the nation's um, power overall and the practice of oral history. So music articulates an era and elevates the voices of the people. It is the soundtrack for one's cultural roots and it provides a language and vocabulary to communicate oneself to the world. This calls for a transition into the Kura sound musical genre and dance tambu, which is also performed in Jamaica. Tambu was once an illegal musical genre and dance in Curacao from 16 from the 1600s to 1956 by the Dutch Catholic Church. The reason the dance was punishable and criminalized is simply because it was an expression that granted one's humanity and a connection with their African roots. Any expression that would bring an enslaved person joy or a sense of self and identity, slave masters or human traffickers found a way to destroy. Tambu is still stigmatized in Curacao. An example of the stigmatization of Tambu are the permits that need to be obtained. And if you do not have a permit, to perform tambu, you will be um, fined. So this dance and takes this celebration takes place um, in early November through December. 
In Come For The Party, Tambu, Curacao's African Caribbean Ritual and the Politics of Memory by Nanette De Jong, she explores the history of Tambu and how it is a medium for resistance and a cultural language for identity. Nanette De Jong states, the holidays have become unofficially known as the Tambu season. Through the Tambu music, there are political messages of resistance and rebellion. The tradition still remains the same. Nanette De Jong states, whereas early afro curasan slaves embraced Tambu as a link to a remembered Africa over a century of social evolution, since, since emancipa emancipation has realigned the ritual with a specific Western European holiday occasion. Tambu relies on the participation of the community, which is a significant part of, the, of African um, spirituality. When that the tambu season would fall onto a European holiday, it evolved further away from its initial cultural tidings. But the root and purpose remains the same. Tambu can be perceived as an overtly sexual dance. It touches upon erotic themes as it is a celebratory dance that was once practiced by enslaved Africans on the plantation. I will display a five minute video of Tambu being performed in Curacao by a dance company, by Curacao um, Dance Company.
Ele é bandinado é para o Vou até parar no jeito aqui, não tem que correr para a Nigéria. Não está em Abutarubé. Não está em Abutarubé. Não está em Abutarubé. Não está em Abutarubé. Agora, mira com o cunhado da brinca. Pé. Seen in figure four, individuals move their hips from side to side as they dance in a line, taking on a masculine and feminine role. Traditionally, the dance was performed by individuals facing one another without ever touching. In conversation with themes of the erotic, the Caribbean American self-proclaimed Black, lesbian, mother, warrior, and poet, R.J. Lorden, uses of the erotic, the erotic as power, explores the erotic as a manifestation of a political and spiritual method that can be used for the destruction of oppression. In connection to tambu, eroticism is explored through a communal and spiritual method that utilizes resistance. Audre Lorde describes the erotic as an intense energy source that can be used to disrupt dis the discourse of oppression and allow for change. Lorde verbalizes the erotic as initiating strength to take on the brunt of re revolutions, sit-ins, movements, rebellions, and revolts. In order to engage with this dance, one has to be willing to engage with, their, with the erotic, to pull from an energy source to produce the work, but most importantly, to allow for an entertaining and joyous dance that is packed with hidden messages of rebellion and resistance. Today, tambu is still practiced in Curacao. It continues to keep true to its meaning of celebration, eroticism, and resistance. As we move across the Caribbean and into Puerto Rico and discuss La Bomba or Baile de Bomba, which was first, first performed on the plantations. La Bomba is traced back to Ghana, specifically from the Akan ethnic group. In solo drumming in the Puerto Rico Bomba, Puerto Rican Bomba, an analysis of musical processes and the improvisational strategies, Salvador explores the history of Bomba. Ferrer states, Bomba is a music dance and song styled style developed in the once Spanish colony of Puerto Rico as early as the 18th century. It is a dance that mirrors African, Taino, Spanish, and Spanish legacies.
it is truly reflective of Puerto Rico. La Bomba is rooted in community, resistance, and identity. The drumming is a specific musical navigational tool that allows for spontaneous movements between the dancers and drummers. The dancers engage with the drummers and the drummers engage with them. It is a bodily communication that the drum relies on the dancer. The sound of the drum is incumbent on the dancer's movements. The faster the movement, the louder the drum. The slower the movement, the lower the sound. Through the dance La Bomba, there are representations of resistance, nationalism, race, oral history, and identity politics of a culturally diverse island. Salvador describes La Bomba as a repertoire of dance that was developed outside of any formal tradition. She refers to it as oral tradition. Traditionally, the participants in La Bomba wear white. The women often have their hair wrapped in an elaborate head wrap. The main controversy is accepting that this dance is deeply tied to Puerto Rico's history of slavery. This history is taught in the songs they sing, the rhythms they drum, and the highly articulate set of movements that the dancers portray. La Bomba expresses the African identity with pride. Ferra states the principal areas of Bomba activity were the, were the regions most associated with plantations in the north and south coast of the island. The bomba was prohibited on the plantations, and because of that, because of because of that, um, it influenced different ways bomba was practiced. Afro Puerto Ricans discovered clever ways to express themselves by using a camouflaged drum made out of found materials on the plantation that replicated similar rhythms found in West Africa. Ferris states the presence of non-Spanish cultural attributes to by disguising them and transferring them onto instruments more closely associated with European culture. The influence of oppression changed the way in which La Bomba was practiced. The message became impenetrable and nearly imp impossible to silence and erase. It was accepted to use instruments that were associated with European culture, which impacted the way in which the community gathered present gathered. Present day La Bomba is slightly different from how it was practiced, especially in the solo and probational dances and drumming, but the spirits remained just the same. So I will display a five minute um, video of two presentations of La Bomba. One was going to be La Bomba y Plena and another one is um, um, Bomba. Um, yeah. Libre. Tú haces lo que en el momento tú sientas, lo que en el momento tú te nazcan hacer. Me ha llevado a quererme, a respetarme, a valorarme. La bomba viene de África, ¿no? De nuestros ancestros los africanos. Me siento honrada porque yo siento que yo estoy representando a mis antepasados, ¿tiene? a mis ancestros. O sea, esa era la única forma de ellos expresarse. Un instrumento, un espacio para rebeliones, ¿verdad? Sirvió. Eh, antisistémica antiracista, anti todas esas opresiones que significaba ese sistema esclavista que había en esa época. 
hoy en día pues, la música sigue siendo un espacio de libertad y sigue siendo un espacio político de transformación. A bailar. Me acuerdo que cuando mi mamá me puso esa ropa, yo me sentí que yo era el video. Yo, ay Dios mío, me encontraba tan bonita. Wow, este es algo con lo que yo me puedo identificar, esto soy yo, esto, esto es parte de mí. Santurcio se convierte en, un, en el primer lugar de donde estaban ubicados los esclavos libertos lo hizo se vuelve en el pueblo donde mayor concentración de negros hay. Esta cueva es una muy antigua y es uno de estos lugares a donde las personas escapadas de la esclavitud, como los cimarrones. Bailar solo pues me gusta también, pero me da mucha más alegría cuando estoy con mi hermana. Y qué alegría, ¿verdad? También estar juntas. La influencia taína la vemos en los términos como la maraca, el cuá. La maraca, el cuá, mantienen el ritmo constante, igual que los tambores. Y el primo, ese es el que improvisa. Una comunicación entre bailador y tocador. La familia Cepeda fue una de las muchas familias que mantuvieron el baile y el legado vivo. El primer maestro que nosotros tuvimos fue don Rafael y doña Caridad. Fueron, fueron los primeros maestros que nosotros tuvimos que nos enseñaron a cómo era esto. El valor de un folclor luchará con mucha fuerza para defender su, su honor. Él siempre luchó mucho porque se reconociera esta música que era tan marginada y olvidada porque es música de trata negra. Dicen la negra Martina que brinca por los palacios, cayó dentro de una olla de bandazo entre las mallas. De bandazo va ella, de bandazo, de bandazo anda ella, de bandazo. Ay, que de bandazo, de bandazo, la negra Martina cayó en la malla, de bandazo. De bandazo va ella, de bandazo, de bandazo anda ella, de bandazo. Se pasaba todo el día buscando, busca en palacio, a ver si alguien la quería, pero todo es un fracaso. De bandazo va ella, de bandazo, de bandazo anda ella, de bandazo. Ay, de bandazo, de bandazo, ay, va la negra, va la negra, de bandazo. De bandazo va ella, de bandazo, de bandazo anda ella, de bandazo. Hoy toditos la recuerdan cuando retorno al palacio, cuando se cayó en la olla, en la malla paso a paso. De bandazo va ella, de bandazo, de bandazo anda ella, de bandazo. Oh, que de bandazo, de bandazo, la negra Martina cayó en la malla, de bandazo. De bandazo va ella, de bandazo, de bandazo anda ella, de bandazo. Me dicen los que la vieron, que brincó por los palacios, cayó en la mamá, 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 de bandazo. De bandazo va ella, de bandazo. We are coming to the close of my teaching. So I want to use these last 12 minutes um, to speak about head wraps. The style of a woman's head wrap determines whether she was a free woman, 
Under the Black Codes or Code Noir passed by France in 18 in 16, I apologize, 1685. It was an impressive set of laws that regulated regulated the ways black individuals presented themselves and navigated their worlds. These laws were placed after the emancipation of slavery in France. Um, the, the laws res were restricted and further oppressed formerly enslaved African individuals who lived in the French colonies. Because of these regulations, it was required by law that Black women cover their hair. This led to elaborate and fabulous head wrapping techniques that further beautified Black women, of course. <laughs> the resistance resorted in vibrant colors, an assortment of shapes, feathers, and gems were placed on the head wraps. These laws were intended to make Black women invisible, but intensified intensified their beauty and made them stand out even more. Enslaved Black women had to wear white cotton as a headpiece, a white blouse, a layered skirt. The first layer was colorful, whereas the second layer was made from cotton and muslin. Also, I, it's important to note that silver, the silver jewelry it was is more than likely a necklace determines whether the the black caribbean a uh, black or, or creole woman was enslaved um there are various uh head wrap styles worn in martinique and at one point head wraps were a marker of ones um in a way their their sexuality or their, their identity class and their standing within their community um, I also want to point out that the head wraps that I will be um, displaying are are not necessarily worn like common day use or um, not everyone wears them. So the madras fabric is used to fashion various head wrapping styles. Madras came to the Caribbean in the 17th century from the Madras state in India which has been renamed to Tamil Nadu. In Indian heritage, in the French Creole-speaking Caribbean, a reference to the Madras material, Helen Zaymore explores the history of the Indian Madras material in the Francophone nation, Caribbean nations of Martinique and Guadeloupe. She states, the Madras fabric was made in the village of Paleka and the French were involved in the Madras in India. Stripes are the main identifying quality, quality of the Madras fabric, which was later added. The stripes uh, make the iconic stamp of the Madras fabric. Before I, I continue, um, I want to also note that these traditional head wrapping styles found in Guadeloupe and Martinique. Um, people do not wear them for everyday uses. Oftentimes it is for um, ceremonies or representations of the past. Individuals still use the madras um, fabric and material to wrap their head in various of different styles. Um, so in a blog post describe, describing the various traditional headpieces worn in Martinique, the author describes the first style as a ceremonial headdress, which is braided into a coil with one tiny end of the fabric sticking up into a small point in the front. So if the woman has one poof sticking up on the top, it means that she, her heart is free, that she is single. Um, two poofs means that she is engaged, but still is looking around. Three poofs means that she is married. Four poofs means um, that if you have the time, I have the desire. Um, yes. As I stated, there are five traditional headdresses in Martinique. I'm going to display a five minute video of a head wrap tutorial um, in Martinique by Afro Spirit. 
um, they are utilizing, by a black woman, she is utilizing the madras material. Um, she's showcasing seven different head wrapping techniques, how you can use the madras um, head wrap.
Diego. Deus fez o mundo é cada um com seu parceiro. Mana não vale ficar sozinha, aqui é dosador. Mana não vale ficar sozinha, aqui é dosador. Mana dosador, 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 dosador. Mana dosador, 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 dosador. attending this teach-in be sure to follow Caribbean Archive and Zaza Uptown lastly thank you Jamie for creating this space and this platform bye y'all thank you <laughs>